Hi, it's a pleasure to be here with you today with VJ Hemock at Ash 2022. It's really an exciting Congress that is, you know, robust and kind of the first real post-COVID um, Ash conference to date. It's a pleasure to be here with my colleague uh, Dr. Andy Bruner from Mass General Hospital, myself, uh, Dr. David Solomon from Moffitt Cancer Center in, in Tampa, Florida. So maybe Andy, to, to start out, maybe we could could think about lower risk MDS. So maybe if you could tell us what abstracts and presentations you're excited about, where do we where do you think we're going in lower risk MDS? Sure. There's actually a lot of moving pieces in lower risk MDS. I think that, um, you know, we have growing data about how we utilize some of the therapies that have been recently improved, notably loose patercept, and what kind of effects that we can expect to see from there. I also think that we're all excited in the field to see ongoing data, for instance, about a metal stat. Mm -hmm. I think there's some very provocative data about long-term responders on a metal stat, and also this curious phenomenon of a drop in VAF during treatment, which I find uh, to be increasingly something that I'm interested in as we evaluate MDS therapeutics. Um, and so I think uh, both of those uh, spaces have, have changed quite a bit. I also think that one of the more um, perhaps controversial uh, studies out there that we're all trying to wrap our heads around, I'm certainly trying to wrap my head around for clinical practice, is uh, the Sintra-Rev trial. So administering lenalidomide for about two years to patients who have not yet developed transfusion dependence, who have uh, MDS with Del5Q. I think it raises a lot of questions and challenges some of our practices uh, in typical management of uh, lower risk MDS. You know, usually we would wait for the disease to present enough uh, immediate risks to the patient before we would initiate therapy. Suddenly we have a lot of provocative data about kind of preemptive therapy almost. And so I think that that's something where each Congress seeing some updates from that, I'm still trying to figure out how that I will integrate that um, into practice. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, yeah, it was one of the more controversial abstracts. I think the data today were, were quite impressive as far as time to transfusion dependence, although clearly no difference in overall survival, at least at the at the current data cutoff. To me, I thought what was kind of very fascinating is there's a growing concern that we shouldn't use lenalidomide in patients that have P53 mutation with deletion 5Q. There's a nice study out of MD Anderson that clearly shows that that clone can expand under, under lenalidomide pressure. I think that being said, they actually did enroll patients with, with P53 53 mutation, those patients, although a small subset, I think it was around six, did relatively equally well. And at least one of the questions, um, it seemed that these patients were not acquiring, which is actually quite surprising. So could we be changing the natural history? Uh, yeah, I think we all all struggle, but it, it is provocative and it's only two years, so kind of a quote unquote fixed, fixed duration. But yeah, I, I think I will think about it. I think there are those patients that are kind of borderline requiring treatment. And to me, I think, you know, maybe more highly supports initiation of LEN over, let's say, ES and those patients that um, you know do have you know symptomatic anemia and, and, and require therapy. I agree. I think the the duration of transfusion independence on the metal stat data. Are, are quite interesting. I mean, some of the most durable responses we've seen. So we hope the iMERGE trial may read out positive in the in the not distant future. I think maybe piggybacking off, you know, can we have disease modification and lower risk myelodysplastic syndrome? I think that's one of our major, you know, major goals. I think how do we define that is, is quite tricky. So, you know, what level of VAF reduction? Is there some reduction, 50% reduction, clearance to less than 5%? Ideally, the deeper is better, but I think we don't really have those, um, have those answers. But I do think disease modification, lower risk MDS is, is really a goal. Um, there'll be an abstract presented by Dr. Garcia Monero on canakinumab, which is an interleukin-1 beta inhibitor. Uh, we similarly have an, an investigator-initiated trial. Um, it seems to be safe, although activity is low, but potentially as you're targeting this in, in, inflammasome microenvironment, you may need sort of novel combinations. So I think, you know, could a single drug be enough or could we think about combinations in order to, uh, to, to change the natural history for this patient group? I think Additionally, maybe lastly, hypomethylene agents, which I think we're trying to avoid for the most part. Can we use lower schedules? Can we use oral therapy in another presentation? I think it's provocative, but again, um, how we move that forward, I think is, a, is, is an is important question. Maybe maybe switching now to, to, to higher risk MDS. You know, we, we still only have azacitidine, but you know, is there a hope for the future? Again, maybe what, what, what data you think is, is, is most intriguing at this Congress? Yeah, I think we're all eagerly awaiting. There's now four large phase three randomized trials that we're all eagerly awaiting for a readout of. Um, uh, you know, our, my hope is that we have a lot of new agents that we can utilize in higher risk MDS. It's, it, it remains a very challenging disease group. 
Um, I think also uh, one of the bigger, I mean, maybe one of the biggest stories that was uh, came out of this ash is just how we are redefining mm -hmm. high risk disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, a number of abstracts looking at new classification systems, trying to identify patients who have the highest risk disease, who have the worst uh, courses, um, either with or without treatment. Um, and also realizing how molecular uh, diagnostics really change our understanding of, who, uh, of uh, the course of patients. So um, interesting study that was comparing IPSS, IPSSR and IPSSM mm -hmm. uh, classifications. And you can just see how we have pulled out these higher and higher risk patients by incorporating uh, mutation uh, from a, a typical NGS panel. Now, where does that lead us? And do we understand uh, how to interpret our old trials yeah. in light of now having uh, moving a bunch of people into higher risk disease? Should we be treating everybody still as if they have higher risk disease or will we have another uh, shift in our treatment where maybe MDS with excess blasts is one entity, mm -hmm. MDS with poor risk mutations is a second mm -hmm. entity approach, yeah. and then we have a different uh, way of approaching lower risk disease uh, given that we think they're going to be stable for some time. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you know, defining biological cohorts, which was sort of the pitch by um, uh, Dr. Hofferlock, I think is intriguing. Yeah, I think we know that we can better prognosticate patients. I think we're refining classifications. I think to me, and I think this is a goal that we have and potentially others is, well, what does this really mean for the treatment of our patients? So a patient that is quote unquote was lower risk is now higher risk. Do we initiate HMA right away? Do we transplant right away? If we have approvals, which we're all, you know, optimistic about, how are we going to think about those patients? So I think we have a lot of data. Now I think we have to think about refining that somewhat and really understanding the outcomes in these patients and how this should dictate treatment. I have a little bit of concerns right now, let's say in the community, okay, patients quote unquote higher risk, are they you know, rapidly initiating therapy for an asymptomatic patient and whether or not that is um, you know, sort, of the, you know, sort of the right thing to do um, or, or not. I think you know, another thing I think quite excited about or quite interested in, obviously Dr. Bruner alluded to the four pivotal trials. We have a glimpse into to one of these at this Congress. We have the um, a stimulus randomized phase two trial uh, presented by, by Dr. Zidon. Um, I think maybe some unfortunate you know, data or, or, or somewhat of a setback. You know, I think the response rates were not different, which is not necessarily unexpected, but I think you know, they were going for this event-free survival based on the durability of outcomes, and at least in the total cohort was negative, although potentially some separation in patients um, with, uh, you know, with intermediate risk disease. I know you've done a lot of work with the Sabatolimab program. I mean, what's your thoughts uh, on those data to date. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it's interesting working with immune-based therapies in MDS, um, especially because if we think that they're going to work, a lot of it is a, a late outcome. Um, and so I think it'll be interesting as we continue to follow that cohort and to see, do we get that long tail that we might hope for with an immune-based therapy? Um, I, based on the mechanism, I agree, you know, you may not expect a difference in response rate per se, um, but can you maintain that response for uh, a different period? And uh, the challenge with that is waiting for the, the long readout, it, it's difficult. I think what we're learning from all of these trials is that dose density seems to matter. And so the ability to maintain a person on treatment, mm -hmm. um, even if that's just regular azacitidine adhering to a fairly uh, regimented uh, treatment schedule seems to be something that uh, is very important that we take in consideration mm -hmm. and as we come up with uh, you know right now we have four doublets in evaluation um, if we're looking at adding uh, a triplet mm -hmm. uh, therapy do we do that how do we think about that do we do that for a time limited period do we plan to have different phases of treatment? Um, what is the gain that we get from a single therapeutic intervention? Uh, and how much does that impact uh, our old standby azacitidine sure, if, we, sure. if, we, if we're uh, delaying people on cycles or changing that dosing regimen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think at least you know the, the, we have three double-blind placebo-controlled trials that now have now fully accrued, including the sabatolimab, the enhanced program with megrolimab, and the venetoclax program with Verona. You know, I'm hoping that with sort of this optimal trial design and focused cohorts on high-risk MDS instead of mixtures, that finally we'll have these uh, breakthroughs and positive studies. Although we kind of eagerly await the data readout potentially first with the you know enhanced trial, ideally in the very near future, at least as far as the readout of the of the CR endpoint. The only on 
ongoing um, you know, trial that is accruing in phase three is the Select 1 MDS trial, which is Tammy Berrettine for, for RARA over Expressor. So I think ideally that trial may accrue faster in the setting of sort of lack of other pivotal trials um, in this setting. I mean, maybe lastly, of course, HMA failure MDS, these patients don't have options. Um, you know, they don't have targeted therapies given those mutations really don't occur in, in MDS patients outside of rare IDH subsets. You know, we've been looking at this CXCR2 inhibitor where we do see some early data across low and high risk patients as far as blast clearance and hematologic improvement, kind of also this immune potential mechanism through MDSC eradication while targeting the leukemic stem cell. But other thoughts that you potentially have HMA failure, anything here um, that we should think about? What about venetoclax or are we just in a challenging space? Yeah, I mean, we don't have a lot of updates on the venetoclax data, although I do think that the data presented previously looking at uh, adding venetoclax to therapy at the time of progression um, is does provide an option that I, often we will consider in practice. Um, I think that uh, some of the other targets that are further along that uh, we may find uh, have a niche in MDS. IRAC4 inhibition um, is an interesting story. It also seems to intertwine with splicing factor mutated disease, uh, which you know represents over half of MDS cases. Um, there are a number of agents trying to, and, and uh, actually some basic science presented at this ASH, looking at new ways to target altered splicing mm -hmm. and vulnerabilities that are created by altered splicing. One of those was uh, uh, looking at the combination of PARP inhibition and ATR inhibition, so really stressing that DNA damage response to be able to uh, take advantage of the vulnerability that altered splicing leaves with DNA damage response. So, you know, we are, uh, as has been the refrain, <laughs> unfortunately, still trying to find that magic bullet for uh, progressive MDS. I mean, to that point, I think that several studies in the last couple of years have really emphasized the importance of transplant consideration. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to think about referral of patients with MDS to transplant, still a number of community, uh, a number of uh, population-based studies showing that the referral rate to transplant is still very low. Yeah. Um, and thinking about that and integrating transplant as a therapeutic goal, really, in a lot of our treatment. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I agree. I'm, I'm hoping, you know, one benefit in sort of these updated classifications is people are thinking about MDS and AML more of as, a, as an overlap. So potentially a lot of the cellular therapies that have only almost been exclusively tested in AML, now some are starting to think about or just enrolling their initial patients with myelodysplastic syndrome. So NK therapy, gamma delta T cell therapy, CAR T therapy, would love to start to see some of these patients. Biologically, they're non-proliferative. You may have more time to get these patients on study. Granted, it's somewhat of a frail population. Uh, at, at, at the same time, but hopefully we can really, you know, further push these clinical trials and, and really give options for these patients um, to potentially get them to transplant or have outcomes optimal to, you know, to transplant. So I think, you know, thank you for, you know, listening to us today. I think it's an exciting time in patients uh, for myelodysplastic syndrome, highly, uh, you know, important to try to get these patients on study because that's really going to be our only path forward. Any, any closing remarks, uh, Dr. Bruner? I, you know, I'm leaving Ash with a lot of optimism. I'm excited for seeing some readouts of some uh, big studies. I hope we have a lot of new agents in our space, and uh, that will give us the next next project to to complete. Thank you. Thanks for having me.